Hi there, my front-end friends. As much as I love talking about all the cool, new, awesome features that are coming out in CSS these days, there are a ton of super useful features that have fantastic browser support that go under the radar. And so today, it's a rapid fire time to go over a bunch of those features. And I'm not alone for this one. I'm joined by my good buddy, Adam Argyle. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm excited about this one. There's so much stuff. I'm like, hey, haven't you heard of Gap? And people are like, what's Gap? And I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where we sort of are always on the cutting edge. We're seeing all the new stuff that's coming. We're excited about that. And then in the middle of a demo, we pass over something really quickly and someone's like, oh, wait, what was that thing you just did there? Right. So it's yeah, we're going to dive into these, try and go over as many as we can. And we're going to try and keep it pretty quick just to make you aware of what these features are. And we're going to be starting off with the first one here, which Adam, I'll let you cover that. It is Focus Visible. Yes, focus visible. So traditionally, a mouse user will like if you click the focus item there at the top, you'll get a yes. focus ring around it. And a lot of designers are like, "Ew, I don't like that." And well, it's like, well, the browser focused it, and that that is the state you you kind of clicked it. But there's also focus visible, which is only going to show if the user is using their keyboard. So if you tab into that one. Now you're going to see it and as you invoke it. So it's sort of contextual to someone using a keyboard. So focus visible is it tends to be the one that you want almost all the time unless you really explicitly want to show that focus outline on mouse interaction. That's it. Yeah, super useful. I love it a lot. As you said, it's the one that we usually want to be getting most of the time. So uh, there we go. Next up, we have focus within. Uh, so another focus state one. And this one's uh, I, one of my favorite ones. I really like it because it was sort of before we had the has selector, it was a way to like select a parent when there was an interaction in the child. Uh, and so I've set up a really simple thing here. I have my form with a focus within. And if I click in there, I have a really subtle shadow. And I'm going to boost that up because we can't really see it too well. And so when I click in there, you can see as long as there's a focus, oops. <laughs> Form submitted. Form ah. submitted. No. Uh, <laughs> let's refresh that page and see what happens. Um, but yeah, as long as we have focus within the element, then we can change the styling of the parent or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be the direct parent. It just as long as there's focus within that element somewhere, we can change the styling of the element. You probably want to do something pretty subtle that's not too in your face for the user because you want to be focused on what you're actually changing and not on the entire element. But it could definitely come in handy. Yep, it's good UI feedback that the form and just like your web page is like, oh, I see you're interacting with this child. Let me just help you isolate where your focus should be. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> but next up, we have uh, dealing with hover and when we don't have hover. Yeah, so there's this at media here, and we can see it there on line eight or so at media hover. And that's me conditionally applying styles if the user can even hover at all. So there it is. You get a nice little label. But if you don't have hover capability, the label's already in the button. So by default, I'm not going to make anybody kind of guess and check here. Um, and there it is. So now we've got a mobile, uh, you know, this person can't hover. Therefore, they should see the label. I'm not going to gate the the label behind this action uh, for these users. And that's how you can do it. And I like how subtle and small the media query is. Just, you know, is hover there? It's just like a presence Boolean. Yeah. So right there. Media hover, nice and simple. Uh, it works well, and it's one of those things where it is the the user. Or it's the system settings are sort of deciding whether or not the primary input is. I think if I remember yes. correctly, yeah. So there's also any hover, right? Which is like, yes. can any of the connected devices to this device have hover? Yeah. Uh, next up, we have fit content, and I wasn't sure which one we were going to be talking about here, but I went with the fit content for grid, uh, just because I feel like it's one that we never um, hear about. And so I just have these two sort of grid template-y things set up. And I set them up right now to be with one FR uh, right there. And this is a little bit problematic because this middle column is not getting enough room because this one on the side is like eating up extra space. So you could sort of you know, be more explicit and play around with it a bit, but you're still using this FR unit. And then you know, the 100 pixels here is kind of arbitrary. It's breaking this onto two lines, which I didn't really want. So we come in with other things. You can try auto, but auto doesn't really work the way you'd expect it to sometimes. Uh, so one thing I find really cool with Grid that we don't see used very much is the fit content function, uh, which sort of says, you know, we want it to fit as much space as possible, but it's going to break it at, it's going to prevent it sort of from getting bigger from that size. So it's a little bit like a min max, but without a minimum on it in a way. Uh, and it will be based on the content, so it can still shrink down. But as we get bigger here, we're, um, it's going to stop when we get to the 40 pixel 
uh, or the 40 character width that I set on that one as a maximum size. And definitely a bit more niche, but in the right situation, it can definitely come in handy. Uh, next up, we have object fit, which this one, I won't lie, I use it all the time. This is definitely one of those ones I just pass over in my demos. And then people are like, hey, wait a second, what's going on there? Um, why didn't I know about that one? Yeah, and this one, the kind of demo is fun as you resize the windows. You see the object is fitting into the size that it has there. And so I've, I've specified object fit cover, which is ensuring that that is going to always stay uh, covering the thing. And there we can see it's squished. And that's because the image has inline and block set to 100%. So I'm forcing it to fit into its parent figure square shape. And then object fit allows that element to sort of like expand or contract, but stay within its own aspect ratio within the constraints of the sort of uh, viewport that we've defined. And it's super duper handy. I totally agree. And speaking of that, we we're talking about aspect ratios. So we have an actual aspect ratio property. And this is another one, I think, that sort of goes with the object fit where people are like, hey, wait, we can do that? Yeah, and this one I, I pulled in open props for just because it's got all these named values for typical aspect ratios. But I mean, behind the scenes, like ratio square is one slash one saying equal sides on all. You can also just say one aspect ratio one. But it's nice to have a variable that kind of describes the intent there. So then we also have landscape and there's portrait. And so these are all like typical um, aspect ratios you'd find on like a TV or video and stuff like that. And they're inside of um, Vizbug or not Vizbug inside of open props. Yeah, you saw the gold ratio one there. That's kind of a joke ish. I mean, it is an actual ratio, but it's like, hey, if you want to use the golden ratio in your design, so it's like go, go to town. But yeah, this is a super handy one for setting um, up images and video that you know need to be in some sort of specific ratio. And then the browser will often hold that ratio very strong. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice. There are ways to break it, but yeah. Yeah, it's for me, the, doing a 16 to 9 ratio on an iframe when you need to embed a video or something, it's you're very happy to have that because uh, then, yeah, yeah iframes are fun. <laughs> uh, so yeah, as you can put, uh, you know, yeah, it's super useful. A very good one. And next up, we have accent color. And this was mine that I put together, but I cheated because I took a demo I believe you built uh, yeah, from like, the hey, web that dev looks blog. Really yeah, <laughs> 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 I, I was going to put this one together. And I'm like, I know Adam did this. I remember, I'm pretty sure I learned it from you. So I'm like, I'm going to go find what he did for that one. Um, and basically, it's super useful. Um, and it was it's the first step we have in being able to st uh, style form elements where you just say your accent color you want and you set a color. And so if I come in here and I change the hue on here, the accent color on these elements will update and change. And it's cool. It works for radio buttons, checkboxes, uh, our range sliders, our progress bars, and it just adds a little bit of styling to them without, you know, without having to create a completely custom thing, which can be really hard and annoying to do. Uh, and actually one other good thing with them is the color of the check and the color of like the circle in the radio button is uh, conditional based on the color of your accent color as well. So if it's dark, it will switch it to a light color automatically and vice versa, uh, or the same idea, I guess, for the radio buttons. So you don't even have to worry about that, which is nice. Up next is carrot color. Um, and this is another sort of like our accent color, where if you have form elements where you have a little, you know, flickering thing to tell the user where their, their mouse is as they enter in their name and other stuff, you can just say you have a carrot color and you choose what color you want and whatever color you want, it, it works. And that's super nice. It's low effort, just like our accent color uh, that we saw. Both of these two, they have good browser support now, but if ever you're worried about it, they're just perfect um, progressive enhancements as well. And it's a little thing, but it goes a long way. And once again, it's a lot easier than trying to come in and do some custom solution here because uh, that would be a nightmare, I think. Yeah, that's a good one to follow accent color up because I'll often have my carrot color match the accent color, match my highlight color. Yep. And then your brand is really like integrated in the experience for the user. It feels really nice. Next up, we have uh, the, I forget the name of this one. This border image. <laughs> border so, yeah, image. Border image yeah. is super powerful. Um, <laughs> recently, an article by T uh, Tamani is just amazing at all the things here. you can do in here. Yeah, and the complex so, but awesome CSS border image property. It really is awesome and complex. <laughs> but this is a really cool uh, example here with a scrim. So it's really common that you'll put this sort of like, you know, gradient and then overlay some text on there. And usually you'll have like a whole caption element and then you have your text inside of there. And you do this whole kind of song and dance to set up that box that's going to overlay the image. Well, you don't need the box. You could just put a border image on the inside of the image 
and stretch it across that center area with that fill zero syntax. And then you got a linear gradient with some of your four digits uh, hex syntax for some opacity. Boom, job done. No extra nodes, uh, super slick. Yeah, when I opened this before we were recording, I looked at that and I was like, wait a second, I could have done that this entire time. <laughs> <laughs> and this feels like one of those things I've known about before and I just keep forgetting because every time I think of border image, it's just complex and hard and I don't want to have to worry about it. And I try and find other ways of doing things. Uh, but yeah. yet, this is one of those super useful use cases right there. Another trick with border image is that kind of like box shadow, you can paint outside of the element without actually consuming space. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there's all these cool tricks where you can use 100 VW and have a background extend out of the element all the way to the viewport edge, which a lot of people would overcomplicate and border image just makes it super easy. Just paint infinitely out the sides and good to go. Nice. Uh, next up we have, I put scroll margin originally, but I'm going to do scroll padding and scroll margin, which are two nice. that I always mix up. And I try one, and then if it's not the right one, I try the other one. <laughs> and I, <laughs> um, So the first thing I've done is I've put a scroll behavior. Um, actually, I'll take off the scroll padding for a second, because I set it up for the padding first. So if ever you have, and I exaggerated the size uh, of my menu here, because usually they're not so big, but it's just a sticky navigation at the top. Um, and when you go to something, it covers the part you wanted to because the middle is actually what's touching the top of the viewport. Yeah. Yep. And you want to, yeah, you want to scream. Um, and I remember back in the day coming up with like jQuery solutions to this, uh, but you can just say scroll padding and it will just add that padding to where the scroll stops and it works. Uh, in a sense, it's a little bit magic numbery because you have to decide how big you want it, but whatever it's so it's super easy to do. So I'm, I'm super happy that we can do that. Um, but at the same time, we have scroll padding and scroll margin. And if you do scroll margin here, it doesn't work. And I always do it. And then it doesn't work. And I have to do a padding instead. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but um, the scroll margin is used for when you're using scroll snap and other stuff when you're going side to side. And then you can add this margin. It doesn't have to be side to side. This could be vertical too. It just with the scroll snap, it just adds like a space there. So if I have a scroll margin of zero, when I scroll over, when it snaps, it snaps exactly to where I'm going. But if I have the margin there, then it gives me that extra space on the edge where it will stop ahead of, if that makes sense. Yes, you've you've shown a great use case. The explanation is quite simple and I didn't know it until I taught it. So just like how you always say, teach stuff and it will uh, teach you. Um, scroll padding is for the scroll container. Scroll margin is for children of the scroll container. And so that's why it might feel ineffective. Like you should be able to use scroll margin mm -hmm. on your other example. You just mm -hmm. have to apply it to the headers as opposed to the scroll port of HTML. There we go. Thank you for that. I learned yeah. something new today too. That makes a lot of sense. And that's why I have the scroll margin on the children here. On the and, children. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that's awesome. I have another video to make now. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next up we have, uh, or speaking of scroll snap um, and, and all of that, I have scroll snap here. Um, so this shows you how to set up a vertical slide uh, snapping setup, really easy for full viewport. And does that one even do the sticky part? I can't tell if it was uh, sticky. Yeah, that does the sticky version, right? Oh no, they're pushing. Okay, they're it's pushing. just low, yeah, yeah. low frame rate in Riverside. I'm struggling to see. Um, but yeah, the scroll snap is super, super easy. If you have an overflow area, um, any child inside of there can be like, hey, I want to snap um, to the edges of some somewhere. And so the, the scroll container says, hey, I got overflow. And then, hey, I want to scroll snap on my Y axis in this example. So any child that wants to snap, I'm a snappable, scrollable area. And then you can specify proximity or mandatory. Mandatory is usually what you need, but proximity is in case you want it to be a suggested, like a suggested stopping point. I call them like a, you know, you go on a road trip and there's like points of interest. Scroll snap is really great for establishing points of interest that also rest really healthy with like the grid layout of a page. And so, yeah, you to, to say it's a scrolling, uh, snapping container and then any child that you want. It could be any nested deep. A lot of people think it's just direct children, but it's any child can say, I want to snap to my scroll port at this posi at this particular edge. And then, of course, you can add margin for that child. So that child could say like, hey, I want to snap to the edge, but I want to be offset by X amount. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's super cool, super useful. It's really handy on touch devices too. Um, just super nice. Yeah, yeah. get that fluid yeah. vibe. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, and yeah, I agree. Proximity is a little bit like you feel like it's not working. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's, it, it did something. Uh, as a user, I always find that one a little bit weirder too. Um, so yeah, like man, it is, uh, yeah. Story is probably and they're both awkward to write for me anyway i can't spell very good <laughs> <laughs> i got uh, lots of words i struggled to spell <laughs> <laughs> awesome um and sort of in that realm of scrolling stuff we have um the snap trap that you're calling it for over scroll behavior contain probably but i mean the idea is really uh made best manifest with like a dialogue you know like a dialogue pops up and oftentimes people are like scrolling in the dialogue. Okay, so like really common, a dialogue pops up and it's like, read our terms. And you're like, yeah, I'm totally not going to read these terms. So you scroll down to the bottom. And then as you get down to the bottom, because you whipped your way down to the bottom, your scroll event okay. bubbles out of your container and starts whipping the page down. And you're like, wait, I was I was out of position in that page. What happened? And that's because the scroll was not contained by default. Scroll events bubble out of a container up into a parent, which all could, could be kind of a cool little hack. But by setting uh, overflow containment to or overscroll behavior to contain, you can basically say, don't let these bubble. I want to trap um, extra scroll events and not let them, you know, leak. I, I basically put this on all of my scroll uh, containers because I don't really know any scenarios where I want that event to leak out. So it's a really good one to know. So yeah, if here on this default one, if I'm scrolling down and there's other stuff, I can keep scrolling and it just sort of goes off the page. Uh, whereas if it's the contain one, I'm still scrolling, but the rest of the viewport isn't going down because we're our, our scrolling is contained to that until my mouse moves off to the side. So superb example yeah. in there. Nice. Next up, we have gap. Um, and this is one of those ones where it's like, what do you mean you don't know gap? <laughs> but so many people <laughs> seem to be unaware of it still. Um, so I set up a couple of really, hopefully quick examples here. Um, there's two times where gap is really useful in my opinion. Uh, if you're doing something that needs consistent spacing, um, you often, you know, grid is a nice tool to use because it keeps everything going the same way. The problem is your spacing, uh, you don't have collapsing margins anymore. The spacing goes big. So you always come in with a margin of zero to reduce them all. And then you run in, like, do you, where, how do you start adding your spacing back in? Just coming in and saying gap. And then you get your nice consistent spacing uh, between all your elements and it just works really well. Uh, and then of course we have it with Flexbox as well, which is newer there, but we just come in and we can say a gap over here. Uh, and then I can add that space that I want. And it's only adding space between the elements. We don't get the space on the outside of stuff, which is generally why margins were always a bit of a pain for that, just because then it would get in the way. Yep, I agree. I like gap too, because it's parent owned instead of yeah. child owned. And a lot of people like to centralize ownership. So like this child is just concerned with its own, you know, size and doesn't have to worry about pushing anybody around. Uh, that's on the parent layout. And I like that workflow. I think it works out nice. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. The one thing I will say is don't always treat gap as a replacement for margins. Sometimes you want, you know, spacing to be relative to the size of the uh, typography and other stuff if it's more of like a long article or something. So it does depend a little bit, but if you just need simple, consistent spacing, Gap is perfect with whatever. Yeah, grid consistent flex is box. a key word there too. Like if you need variable typed spacing between items, Gap isn't going to let you specify one rem here and two rem over there. Yeah, uh, it's very much a flat specified value. Yeah, and where Gap actually came from is columns originally. Um, and at one point you had to do a column gap, but now we can use Gap there. And columns is another area where I think not enough people know that columns exists. I agree. Uh, and it's been around for for a really long time now. And it's really cool because it's like super responsive, even though often the syntax doesn't look like it. Because I'm basically saying here, I want three columns that are 200 pixels each. But if it doesn't have enough room at one point, it's just going to go, OK, well, now I have two columns because I couldn't fit three while you were sticking to around that 200 that you wanted. Uh, and then we can shrink down and we can go even smaller if we want. Um, and yeah, it just, it, it's pretty cool how it works. Uh, I'm also using a column rule here, which is adding a little decoration. It's kind of subtle, so you might not see it. So I'll just change the color of it there to make it a bit brighter. Um, but you can add decorations in, in your column rules, which is something that people have been hoping for in grid for a long time. And I think is on the way, but for now, uh, columns is one of the places we can do it. Yeah. Clamp is really nice in there too, for the value. Um, yes. Like, hey, never go below 20 characters because then it turns into a really impossible to read column. But don't grow up too big. Then that, that's hard to read, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing, just really fast, I am doing a column 
span or yeah, column span of all on the top. So this one is in my columns, but we can actually, you know, you can control if you want things to be able to span more than one column as well. The one thing that's kind of weird is sometimes where things break. So there is some extra stuff that you might want to get into, especially if you have background colors or cards or other stuff that are getting involved in it. Um, or if you have margins too, sometimes alignment can be a little bit of an issue, but it's, I think can be useful in the right use cases um, and definitely worth checking out. Really quick on that last one. Um, I see an orphan on your third paragraph. If you give your paragraphs text wrap pretty, does that go away? Yeah, it did. Nice. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> So th there's one that uh, not, doesn't have the best browser support, but is a really good progressive enhancement. Um, so you could use it today, and it will just fix little words like or that are all by themselves floating yeah. off. Uh, so on their own. lonely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, here's a friend, text wrap pretty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and if any of you have heard about text wrap balance before, that's for shorter things. I think it's a maximum three lines of text. It's more for your headings. Text wrap pretty is for longer things like paragraphs and stuff um, where you get a lot more text and get little orphans at the end. Next up, we have a uh, drop shadow versus box shadow. Yeah, and this one is always surprising that folks don't know about too. So I just made this really simple demo, classic icon scenario where you're like, I wanted the drop shadow to be underneath the shape. And then it does this box thing. You're like, ew, well, just <laughs> switch to filter drop shadow. And it essentially takes the same syntax. You can't spread uh, if that's important to you, um, but you can essentially uh, otherwise achieve the same effect and it looks really nice. Um, and then we have Matrix 3D, and I gave this one to you on pur purpose because it just confuses me. So I'm hoping you can enlighten me a little bit on how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one is definitely um, a specialty needs where you can kind of uh, get direct access to the GPU sort of positional points that are going to be set for something. Um, and I provide an example here where I tried to make the numbers reasonable to see because otherwise they can get unreasonable really quick. There is a method to that madness. I'm not going to explain it. Uh, cause that wouldn't be a quick example, but it's just nice to know that there is this matrix 3d concept. And in case you're coming from a 3d space and those are the coordinates and the data that you have, you can pass it straight to CSS. I did provide an example where, um, you could drag around. Is that, uh, open in your next tab? And that was cool because you could see a regular matrix that had no transformations applied. And then you can grab the corners and tweak the element and see what the matrix, uh, CSS is. So if you wanted to sort of like play around with this, find the shape and the angle and the way that you're looking at setting something up, then you can steal it and take it and put it somewhere else. And of course, this is animatable. So if you want to animate between these states, you can do all sorts of cool stuff with it. That's really cool. That makes life a lot easier. Whenever we have generators for these complicated things, it, it you're or on the you know makes it makes it more much more usable. Um, uh, next up, we have backdrop filter, which is one that gained a little bit of popularity because of the uh, the blur and the glass morphism. Um, but it, there's still a lot of people who don't know about it. So I want to go through a few things with it, though. Um, but the first thing is, generally speaking, you're going to have a background color on your element that you're going to do this on, and it's going to be somewhat transparent, um, just so you can see through it. If it's fully opaque, it's not going to do anything. But as long as you can see through it a little bit, then you can do stuff like the blur, which just blurs the background behind it, which is kind of cool. This is that classic glass morphism style that uh, is um, been around for a little while now, and it's just nice. The it helps make things more readable too. If you have text um, and you have different backgrounds, it can be good. A lot of people stop there though, and they don't realize there's other stuff we can do. For example, you can change the brightness of things that are behind it. You can make them darker, or you can actually make them brighter too if you want. Uh, which is interesting. You can change the saturation to desaturate what's behind it, or you can play with the contrast on there, reduce the contrast or increase the contrast, whatever you want. Or of course, you can combine a bunch of them together, just space separated, no commas. Uh, and then you can sort of, this one's probably a little bit overdone, but uh, with the high brightness, but then you can come in and do whatever you want with it um, and have some fun with your backdrop filters uh, and get some interesting effects going on. Next up, we have any link. I love this one because uh, yeah, Let's, what is any link, Adam? Yeah, any link. I have three links there. The first one has no href. The second one has just a hash href. And the third one has a full on URL inside of it. And what's cool about any link is you don't have to. So a lot of times you'll be targeting links and you're like, ew, if it's a link that goes nowhere, I don't want that to look like a link. 
And that's what any link is specialized for. It will only select the elements that are full links of some kind. And so you get to automatically ignore the ones that are missing hrefs and um, which is kind of a cool little handy selector. Yeah. So if I just make that an A, then it's selecting the A element, even though that's not actually a link. So yeah. any link comes in and, and fixes that problem for us. Awesome. Next up, we have empty, uh, another pseudo class selector thing. Um, there's a lot of different use cases for this, but this one I, I think is, is a decent one. Um, so it's a bit more of a complex demo that I pulled up from a very old uh, video or collab I did actually with WebDev Simplified. Uh, but the idea here is if you come in and you have sort of these lists that are coming in, you can see that there's a background on this area. Um, and that's all coming from this UL. And then in that UL, we're inserting the LIs as we create new things. But what would happen normally, and I don't have any LIs or anything, um, but on here, I am doing a task list. If it's empty, I'm doing a display none on it. Because if I don't do that, I have some padding and some other stuff on there. So that means that I just get this box that's sitting there because of the padding, the background colors coming through. That's really annoying. Uh, whenever I talk about empty, people are just like, oh, everything you're doing, you should be just be handling with JavaScript anyway. I don't really want to be looking and inserting a UL if there's no current LI. Like that's a lot of extra steps along the way. I could just have this empty UL waiting for content to come in and then just say, well, if there is no content, it disappears. And then as soon as something gets inserted into there, it shows up. Yeah, excellent. It could be just like hydration too. Your component yeah. initially gets inserted as just like a random tag that has no content. You're waiting for JavaScript. Well, you're like, CSS could be doing the same thing you have there. Could have padding yeah. and a background color. And you're like, what's this weird node? And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next up, we have this, which is uh, our first or and last child um, that I want to take a look at. And so this is sort of a common use case that I use it for, not necessarily like this. Uh, but often, you might have a navigation or something that on mobile, you might want some lines that are dividing it or whatever. Uh, and I just don't want this last one to have it. And of course, I can make these all top, but then the first one would have a line on it, which <laughs> sucks. So we just do not last child. Uh, and then the last one doesn't get the border on it. And you can also target your first child as well. So not last child or not first child uh, to target either the first or the last one and then leave everything else and give it the styling. Of course, I'm combining that with the not because I tend to use that that way a lot. Uh, there's probably times where you want to target just the first child or just the last child as well. But yeah, it can be super useful. Um, yeah. I also <laughs> use first of type and last of type all the yep. time too because first child and last child um, like it doesn't take your predicate. Like you say li yeah. first child, um, but it still could find more than what you were bargaining for. And the first of type and last of type could be really handy there. Yeah. So like, yeah, uh, sometimes if you have like a lead paragraph or something, you could just have your P uh, first of type. And then if there's other yeah. things before it, you know, boost the font size of that one and, and you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, next up, we have, you have an emoji list that we have here uh, using our uh, list style type. Whoops, I went way off, but there we go. My list style type. Yeah, this one's cool, and I just don't see it used enough to making to, to make lists fun. So this this demo shows two features. The first feature we want to talk about is list style type, and just the ability to like change bullets to other stuff. Um, but up above that definition, you can actually define your own counter styles as like an array, and it will repeat and cycle through the different dots that you have specified. And I used a bunch of emoji, and you can see them uh, cycled through there all by for free. You just tell the browser, here's a little algorithm for how to do uh, symbols on, on the markers, and it does all the work. It's pretty sweet. Uh, next up, we have inset. Uh, inset's one of my favorite things. I use it all Damn. the time now. Yeah. Uh, which here, whoops, I went way off, but I have a parent that has position relative, and then the child has a position absolute, and then my inset's 20. So this is the same as a top, bottom, left, and right, all set to 20. Uh, so I can make it zero and the same uh, idea. You could come in with a bigger number. Uh, it's just like your margin shorthand. So it's top, bottom, top, right, bottom, left. So if I come in with different values here, uh, we can sort of circle around and it'd use the same type of shorthand if you omit any characters uh, the, you would get. And the other thing that is super cool with it is, um, or maybe not cool, but super useful with it is if you come in and you do an auto, that's the same as like not declaring the value there. Now mine's completely disappeared because it has no size to it. Um, but that would be like, I'm declaring a top, a right, 
and a left, but I'm not declaring a bottom on it. It's, at least that's my understanding of how that works. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So it can be handy, but again, this is a silly demo. So that broke everything I was trying to do. <laughs> I also uh, like inset because it has a logical property side to it too. Yes. Um, but yeah, the shorthand is physical. If you do inset inline or inset block, uh, you can get to the logical yep. property side of positioning. Yeah. Yeah. So inset inline, let's just turn that off for a second. Inset inline, let's say we do 100 pixels and then inset block, we can do that at 50 pixels. Um, so we have 100 on the left and the right. And then the block, which is our up and down axis right now, um, would be there. And those would change if the writing direction ever got switched to a vertical writing mode. Uh, the other reason I like inset is it is a really nice way to center things. Um, yeah, inset instead in line of, auto. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because if you have, <laughs> yeah, if you have a, uh, say the child, let's just give this a width of, I don't know, 50 pixels or something. And we'll use aspect ratio since we just talked about that ratio of one. So I get a square. Um, you can see my squares there. I can just set this to its inset of zero and then a margin of auto and it will center. And you don't have to use that weird translate transform trick to like reverse, you know, top left 50% and then negative 50% and stuff. Uh, yeah, a little bonus one right there. Um, and I think we're at the end of our list. Yes. Oh, sad. <laughs> <laughs> it went so fast. It did. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for, for joining me for that, though, Adam. Uh, and if anybody has any other ones that we went over and we didn't mention, let us know in the comments. And if you like this type of video, let us know, too, because we definitely would you know, do more of these in the future that are a bit more fast paced. Uh, there'll be a bunch of links to tons of stuff in the description if you want to get access to anything or read more about any of these or find other resources on any of them. And yeah, thank you very much.